Today, we are very fortunate to have with us, all the way from Singapore, Sister Sylvia Bay, who will be sharing with us on the significance of Vesa. Now, Sister Sylvia Bay has dedicated herself to the study and practice of the Buddhist teachings since 1992. She holds a Bachelor of Arts Honours in Buddhist Studies from the Buddhist and Pali University of Sri Lanka, where she later lectured. She also has a Master's in International Public Policy from the John Hopkins School of Advanced Studies. Since 2001, she has been a regular Dharma speaker in Singapore and regionally. Sister Siva first published her first book, Between the Lines, in 2013, and is now working on a second book, Towards the Light. So let us welcome Sister Sylvia with her sharing on the significance of Vesa. Sister Sylvia, over to you. Everyone, um, I'm very happy to be here to talk to your members and brothers and sisters in the Buddhist community. Um, I, I wait. Let me let me try to pull out my slides first, huh? Okay on a uh, somewhat celebratory tone. So there will be all kinds of events, singing, uh, story recitation, uh, plays, and so on and so forth. It's an event. They become events that people celebrate. And, and for many communities, it's a day where they go down to the monastery, to the temples, to pray, ask for blessings, and so on and so forth. Nothing wrong with these. But in my, my personal view is that Visa is a lot more than a celebration of a man's life. It is, it, it is, um, it has significance beyond just just commemorative events. So today my talk is to flesh out what I think are significance of the Vesa that people should be mindful of. And if they have that as part of their psyche, then Vesa can take on an extremely joyous very joyous meaning and it, it can bring out for everyone that sense of gratitude, uh, the, the increases the sense of faith, sense of belonging. So that's what I hope to do, to be able to do today, to show you that Vesa is a lot more than just commemorative a person's life, okay? Many of us in the Buddhist community, especially in the Theravada community, will understand the word Buddha Sasana. Buddha Sasana means the age, a period where the Buddha's teaching is still around and, and, and still true to its original meaning. So years back, 2,500 years ago, Buddha said this, the appearance of six things, it's rare in the world. So if you reflect on each one, don't just take it as, oh, Buddha said this. Don't do that. Look at each, each thing on its own. A realized one, a, perfectly, a perfected one, a fully enlightened, awakened Buddha. We live in an age where he's not here anymore, but this is the age that the teaching is still around which means that this age, we still have Buddha. As the Buddha himself said, you see the Buddha, you see the Dhamma, you see the Dhamma, you see the Buddha. We have the Dhamma, Princeton, clean, pure. So the Buddha is still with us, okay? And why is this so significant, so rare? Did you take how many eons to count? to be a Buddha, you know how many person, how many being could actually achieve this? It's incredible. It's, it, it's, it's unthinkable. It, you just ask yourself, will I be prepared to take on this duty, this responsibility and cultivate life after life after life 
for eons and you don't even know when it will end. And you keep doing it until the mind hits a point where it can realize the mind on its own without help or guidance. It's incredibly, it's unbelievable the kind of effort to put in to realize. But yet he did it. And we live in a fortunate age where his teaching is around. This incredible. It's, it's, it's life kinds of cultivation and practice and goodness, meritorious deeds that your predecessors had done in the past for you to have this opportunity. Second, person who teaches the teaching and training proclaimed by a realized one. Buddha's no more, but his students, the Sangha, is still around. So we live in an age where there are Sangha members, teachers who have done their own training, their own teaching, uh, their own uh, practice, and be in a position to be able to explain the Dhamma. To live in an age like that, it's incredible because it means we have someone to turn to. We don't know how to do it, but we have someone to turn to who can guide us there. So two, the rebirth in a civilized region. The, let's take this word carefully, civilized, because every society would think they are quite civilized. But if you take one step back and you look at the possibilities, there will be the ones that you say, this is a good place to be reborn in. And that's not, okay? The idea here is it's a place where it's peaceful. There is security. People have, people are not caught up with um, livelihood issues. They don't have to worry about living day to day. So they have time on their hand to reflect on life and to be touched by the Dhamma and learn the Dhamma. That's the idea, that the conditions, the external conditions are peaceful and so they are able to go in search of spirituality. If you are caught up trying to stay alive day to day, you won't have time to look at the Ma. Buddha himself, incidentally, Buddha himself was born in a period when India was broadly at peace. India... For, for several hundred years, actually had many wars going on. The Indian Saki is all about conflict and fighting. But Buddha, when he was born, it was a period where there was relative peace. Relative peace, because there was still warfare. In fact, the last period of the Buddha's life was all about warfare. The warfare had started again. Okay, So Buddha himself was fortunate. So he can say, Rebirth in a civilized region is a good thing, okay? Unimpaired sense faculties means you can, your senses, your sense bases are all working properly and there is nothing blocking you. We live in an age where technology and medical advances can compensate if you do have some biological handicap. But for centuries, if you're biologically handicapped, you have big problem. It's hard even to live day to day, let alone learn the Dhamma. Being bright and clever, we all are. That we are all here on a Sunday morning instead of going out gallivanting somewhere, with that we are all here to listen to the Dhamma implies there is some wisdom in you. That you listen and you can understand means you are bright and clever. If you have some mental obstruction, so four is physical obstructions, five is mental obstructions, you have either, it's so much harder to go learn the Dhamma. Okay? And number six, you are enthusiastic for skillful qualities. Let me explain that. You know in your life, you know, there are individuals who will choose to drink, be drug addicts, to, 
to waste their life away, maybe playing computer game or just indulging in all kinds of vices. But you're not. You want to be a better person. You want to know what does it take to make you a better, happier individual who is a, a boon for society, for the people around you. You are a blessing. So number six is when you have that in your mind, you want to be a better person. You want to help others. You, you, you want to improve yourself. Ah, that's you. Number six is you. So you do your own take. If you have six upon six, in the words of the Buddha, you are a real person. If you have six upon six, five upon six also we take. Uh, okay, upon <laughs> six we take. So one, two, and three, for, mem for all of us sitting down here to be able to watch this talk, you have easily most of these qualities. So you are quite a rare person, okay? Now, what does it mean? Huh? Take one step back and reflect. You live in an age of Buddha Sasana, a period where the Dhamma is still there, okay? What does that mean for you? For me, it means one, access to true adulterated Dhamma. This is very critical. Above all, this is the most critical. Because with Dhamma, you can learn to be a better person. You basically, what is Dhamma? It basically is a handbook, a, a um, manual. It's a manual that explains how what you must do and how you can do it to be better than what you are now, to improve, to be happy, to be able to get out of Dukkha. That's what it means by Dhamma, that in, within the Dhamma, it's material that can help us understand the nature of the mind, and to be able to do the steps, do the necessary to be able to experience. You, you, you do your cultivation. It will help you to get out of Dukkha. Put it simply, is it's a way that one can practice to get out of suffering. Okay? And without this manual, seriously, without this manual, how many of us know? How many of us would know how to get out? Most of us would just be trapped in some sorry, go round and round and round and round and round. Life after life. And it's not funny, you know. If you think about it, it's not funny. If you, if you have lost someone recently, if you have lost someone you love recently, you will truly appreciate how painful it is to hang around and live and die and be born and die and be born and die because, because it means in your lifetime, you will lose people that you love. You will feel the pain, the stabbing pain of loss. To have the ma, to know what to do gives you a chance to break out of this samsara. You don't have the dhamma. You are literally like a mouse or the guinea pig, you know, on that on the treadmill. Uh, no, no, treadmill. I don't know. That, that, ferro, that wheel, and you go round and round and round and round and round, and there is no way out. That's what it means. Age of Buddha Sasana. I've mentioned this in brief earlier. What it means is there are teachers, teachers, inspiring practitioners, helpful companions. These are three levels of practice, in other words. People who learned, practice, and know what it takes, how to get out, those are your teachers. 
people who are walking this path with you, struggling with you, but they are doing it very well. Perhaps they are more, they are more uh, invigorated, more energetic than you. It doesn't matter. But these guys, because of how they push themselves, what sacrifices that they have made to get to do their practice, they are very inspiring. Being with them gives you, motivates you, gets you going. Okay, that's what it means. And helpful companion, your Kalyana meter, Kalyana, wholesome, good friends, friends who, who help each other to stay on track. Don't give in to your Akusala. Cultivate, more, basically learn to be Kusala. Anyone who hang around and tell you, don't give in to your anger. Bring up your meta. Bring up patience. Be generous. I, you all do this together. They are your helpful companions. Okay? All this while, the point I'm making is Buddha Sasana period means you have a chance to grow and break out of samsara. A chance. Uh, it doesn't mean that the individual will do it. Look, all of us live in the age of Buddha Sasana. This is the period. But the pool of Buddhists and the pool of Buddhists who are practicing and the pool of Buddhists practicing properly according to the path. You can see that the that pool shrinks. This is the age of Buddha Sasana. Every individual is in it. But the Buddhist community, this amount. The Buddhist community, within the community, people who know what to do and how to do it, lucky small, very small. For those who, who don't speak, Malay, lagi is even smaller, okay? Even smaller. So you, you ask yourself, if you take, take, take the box for all six, the boxes for all six, and you are a practitioner, and you have access to teachers and practitioners and helpful companions, how lucky are you? How much blessing are you enjoying? That's why I say it is immeasurable blessing because you have this manual. You know how to protect yourself. You know how to gut yourself against falling. The point is we all walk on tight ropes and we can fall. But with the Dhamma, with the guidance of teachers, with helpful friends around us, with this desire to practice, you know how to stay on that tight loop. It's a measurable blessing. Okay? Far better than being born with pots and pots and pots of gold. Far better than being born in a land where you can just enjoy all manner of luxuries. Because they are all impermanent. They will all finish. Everything, every good stuff that you have will all finish. Dhamma will also finish. We know that. But with the Dhamma, you can keep the conditions good for life after life. Conditions, you can keep to the right conditions for practice, for, for what you now enjoy. You, you know how to do that. Okay? The resilience of Dhamma. Vesak means resilience of Dhamma, isn't it? It means Dhamma is still around. 2,500 years after Parinibbana of Buddha, you still celebrate Vesak, which means Dhamma is still around. And Vesak is testimony of its endurance and resilience. And this part, I cannot emphasize enough. For those of you who know history, if you do know history, you will know that the Dhamma came close to being snuffed out many times. I'll give you an example.
Asuk Ashoka, King Emperor Ashoka, lived about 200 years, there about 200 plus years. Maybe shorter, maybe longer. Scholars also could agree. Okay, for those of you who actually have a date of Ashoka's birth and all, right, that date is best guess. It is not, maybe real, may not be. It's best guess. Okay, the reality is he lived just a couple of hundred years after the life of Buddha, after the lifetime of Buddha. Now, before you, you, you must try and place that time. What it means is, if you if, if you're staying here, this 2021 is your timeline. 200 years ago is what? Victoria, England. Qing Dynasty, China. Do you understand that? It's a long time ago. But it's not that long as we are from him, right? It's about 200 years. It's not close. Okay. He did a fabulous job of strengthening the dhamma okay strengthening the triple the, the the buddhism if you like use it loosely he strengthened buddhism in in very very significant ways he sent he he sponsored dhamma missions out of india the the indian empire that he ruled he sponsored uh nine missions out of that okay so at his I say it reached the Ma reaches reached its height under him because he gave a lot of money, he built a lot of monastery, there were a lot of support for propagation of the Ma. A few hundred years later, fifth, sixth century, we're talking about five, maybe six, six, seven hundred years later, decline was there, significant decline by 12th century, almost wiped out, wiped out. What you see today in India, Buddhist, the, the, the Buddhist community in India is minuscule. It was wiped out since the 12th century. Okay. And if it were not for Sri Lanka, which is the last bastion of Theravada Buddhism, okay, if not for Sri Lanka, there is no more Theravada Buddhism today. There, there isn't word of the elder, no more. Okay, but Sri Lanka itself faced problem in the first century a, uh, CE. CE is this 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 century uh, this 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 period. Okay, extinction pressure. There were uh, famine and uh, political unrest. People people were dying in doves. And one of the reasons why the Dhamma was written into Ola leaves was because the monks were afraid that if the last of them die, no one else had Dhamma. So they quickly wrote it down. It was completely wiped out in Central Asia. Again, for those of you who don't know history, at one stage, Central Asia was a, a, a very vibrant place for Dhamma. It's a Buddhist community. Otherwise, we got Bamiyan Buddha. You know how giant that Buddha is? It's huge in Afghanistan. So there was one period in history before 5th, 6th century CE when that region was Buddhist and Central Asia was the route to, to, uh, to which Dhamma went to China. Dhamma went to China via Central Asia, okay? And of course, it was almost, ex almost extinguished in Indonesia. At one stage, Indonesia, uh, uh, Sri Vijaya, Sri Vijaya Empire, which is in Indonesia, was Buddhist. That's why Borobudur was there, okay? Now, nothing to weep, about it will happen. Buddha knew that. He, he, he taught his students what to do. He told them how uh, what they had to do to try and postpone that decline. But he knew eventually it will happen. 
people will forget its teaching, people will get it all wrong. So they either forget, they corrupt, they get it wrong, or whatever it is, the ma as you know it today will start will start to disappear. I, I don't want to use, I, I'm trying to think of a word where it's more, the decline is more subtle. It will take centuries, but the decline is actually quite subtle. You don't know it is vanishing while you are living through the age. You don't know that it's happening. But when it's done, historians down the line, people down the line will look back and say, that's the period it started. The decline, the decline started, okay? So the good news, it's still around. The bad news, eventually it will disappear. But the good news is it will come back. Many eons now, it will come back, okay? So I, I don't want to end on a sad note. Nah. Immeasurable contribution of Sangha. Some of you have spent a lot of time supporting Sangha, looking after them, being with them. Your effort are immeasurable. It's really great. For the rest of us who have not been spending a lot of time supporting Sangha, I hope that after you have listened to this talk, you will be very inspired to go down and do your part to protect noble Sangha, pure Sangha. Go and protect look after them because sangha is around good sangha pure sangha righteous practitioners if they are around dhamma will live on if sangha starts to disappear dhamma will disappear okay vesak marks the birth of sangha as spiritual leader doctrinal teacher for the Buddhist community. I read this word and I feel very joyous. I also feel uh, very touched because Buddhists know more, right? Then who leads the community? Sangha, okay? Doctrinal teacher because they are the one who are custodian of the Dhamma. You may not know this. Uh, you may not know this. But let me share something with you. Up until this century, or maybe last century, 20th century, in fact, the second half, the last third, the last third of the 20th century, Sangha was almost the sole custodian of the Ma, which means to say your tipitaka, only the Sangha knows. Okay? up until maybe the last third of 20th century. Sangha knew, only the Sangha held on to Tipitaka. The lay community barely had a, a sniff of it. Okay, And I said here, this is the early days. I have two slides here on the early days of the Sangha and today. And they were, they were very critical in the preservation of Dhamma. When Buddha passed on, who led community? Sangha. Specifically, a group of Arya Sangha, Sangha who were realized. And that group of Arya Sangha came together and amongst themselves, they were not instructed by Buddha. On their own accord, scores and scores of them the, the commentaries, the, the text will tell you 500. But the reality is we don't know how many, but there were many who came together and collated. They told each other, let's, let's all try and remember what he taught, what he said, word for word, we try and preserve it. So they came together 
They chat, 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 chat. It was a meeting that lasted many months. But at the end of the meeting, we believe they were able to compile minimally a first draft. Minimally. It may well be the whole thing, but minimally it was a first draft of the Buddha's teaching and they collated it. They collated it, they figured out a way where they all collectively as a community will preserve his words. The instrumental in preserving the Ma after Parinibbana. Mind you, uh, today you have social media, you have laptops, you have your computers and you can preserve anything you want. Anything. This talk, at the end of which you can preserve it if you want. 2,500 years ago, there was no even proper writing. There was no write, there was writing. It's not to say there was no writing, there was. But the number of people who can read, one in a million. Okay, now maybe I'm exaggerating, one in a hundred thousand. So what's the point of having writing? Therefore, they had to preserve by hearing. So just imagine, okay, a whole bunch of, whole group of monks preserving teaching Memory work, pure memory. And they held on to this. They held on to this for a couple, a few hundred years. That was how they do it. So you just imagine how much debt we owe the earliest Sangha for doing that, for carrying on the Dhamma, holding on to the baby like it is the most precious. It is indeed the most precious thing they had. So they held on to it, okay? Sole custodian of canonical texts for centuries, I told you, up until the last centuries and probably the last period of the last centuries, then the Dhamma appeared on the internet, on books everywhere, in English. So the bunch of us who are educated in English can read Dhamma. You can read Pali. Most of us can't read Pali anyway. So even if they were there and you have them, you own the hacks in Pali, you can't read them. Okay? And it's the same, it's translated into many languages today, including Russian and French today. All this happened within the last 20 years, okay? And they were at the forefront to propagate the Ma. Forefront to propagate the Ma. Now, untrodden path means they go to places where the ma wasn't at. In case you're saying, oh, this is not so difficult. Hello, you try and propagate the ma to, let me see. I don't know. One, you think in your mind, you just think of one country that you suspect doesn't have quite much of the ma. You go there and propagate. You have no resources. There is no one supporting you. How do you do that? But they succeeded. When Dhamma left India to go to Central Asia and Sri Lanka, those were untrodden paths. When Dhamma went from those countries to Southeast Asia, so, so Sri Lanka, they went to Myanmar, to Thailand, to Suhana Bumi. They, when they went to these places, it was also untrodden. Meaning there were some, there were the individual merchant who professed to be a Buddhist, perhaps, but they were not, as a community, they were not Buddhist. So you go blind into a region with no GPS, no map, barely any support, and you have to teach the Dhamma. And these monks did it, you know. It's just incredible, the sacrifice, the courage that it took. In fact, in the time of the Buddha, there was one monk who told the Buddha, after he realized, you know, Arahant, he told the Buddha he's going to go back to his um, Suraparanta, I think that was his, what the, that place was called, Suraparanta. Uh, he wanted to go back to his hometown to propagate the monk. Buddha said, oh, that place, the people, quite brutal, uh, meaning they beat up, they, they, are, they are not, civilized okay they're not as civilized so buddha said what if they they scold you 
they abuse you. He says, no problem. Words can't kill, no problem. Then the Buddha said, what if they beat you? They attack you physically. He said, no problem. If I'm alive, I can do it. <laughs> so this guy has tremendous courage. He's basically saying, it doesn't matter the risk to my physical being, I will be there to teach the monk. That's the kind of courage that the early monks have. So I will strongly encourage you, if you like, go and read up on the life of the monks to be inspired by what they had done to keep the Dhamma alive. Okay? And these are historical monks. I'm telling you, even today, there are tremendous tremendous contribution. First, think, in your mind you think of all the monks that you know, that you respect because they know they walk the talk. They walk the talk, meaning what they teach, they practice. How they explain the ma it becomes, you can see it reflected in their way of life. So that's what I mean by embodiment of practice and path. We all, we all will not have respect for a monk who is like us. I mean, we enjoy lay life, right? Then the monk also enjoy lay life. We will have no respect. But the ones that we find most inspiring, and there are many of them, many, we find them very inspiring because, my gosh, the sacrifice that they made to be able to walk this path, we say we can't do it. We don't have that stamina. We don't have that, that mind, that mental strength, that resilience, that courage. I'm telling you, monks of the forest tradition, they go into the forest to practice, to meditate the dark, dark forest with no torchlight, no nothing. You only have moonlight, okay? And they go there to meditate. That's how powerful, how great these monks are. Okay, specifically, specifically their contribution today, which we are all beneficiaries of, okay? They translated canonical texts, translated, make them accessible to all. Immediately, your mind go to Bhante Bhikkhu Bodhi. Most of us today who refer to the suttas, we can quote this causes sutta one, two, three, four, five, because of Bhante Bhikkhu Bodhi. Now, before Bhante Bhikkhu Bodhi, before him, there were English translations. Okay, I'll just talk about English translation because we are, most of the audience here speak English anyway. I've heard of the Pali Text Society. Pali Text Society was broadly lay people, okay? And they did the first set of translation. But they're not accessible. They're not accessible because, number one, the English is a little... Chim. It's, it's a bit too uh, highbrow for most of us. We, we, it, it's very old English. Shakespeare would have been easier. It's old English. It's hard to understand, number one. Number two, they are really expensive. I remember my first set of one of these volumes, right? cost hundreds of dollars, hundreds. One, how to afford, seriously? And they are only in hard copy. They are not online, okay? So you have to get your own set or you just park yourself in the Buddhist library somewhere. If you want to do research, you just park yourself there. But Bhante Bhikkhu Bodhi, his translation is not... You have the, the, the more expensive version get from wisdom publication, but you can also get from countries that had some arrangement and they can print it cheaper. Okay, So that's translated text. Huh? That's him. 
that's translated and make accessible. Bhante uh, Ajahn Sujato and, and uh, uh, Ajahn Tanisaro, they are behind the internet depository of canonical texts. They are monks who lead the effort to put all these texts online for our convenience and for convenience of, research, of researchers of Buddhist or Buddhist teaching everywhere. At a touch of a button, you have access. Who did this? Sangha. Sangha did it. I love this one. As a scholar, I love this. They did such wonderful research work. Some of the best writing, personally, in my view, right? Some of the best research work done on the, on the Buddha's life, on the Sangha, was done by monks, okay? <clears throat> I said practitioner enablers. This period, online, so many Sangha had come online to teach Dhamma. And how many people around the world are benefiting from their guidance. They are Dhamma enablers. We listen, we get inspired, even we don't understand a lot, but we get so inspired, we go meditate. Then we stay wholesome, wholesome, wholesome. Then we forget, but it's okay. The next teaching come online and we remember and we keep going. They are so, cri so critically important in helping us stay on track. Stay on track. I personally have benefited significantly from the teachings and the guidance of Sangha like Pante uh, Gunaratana or uh, Achan Jayasaro um, and then so many others. Sit in, you listen and you go, oh, this is so inspiring. It's just like that. That's how we keep going, okay? This one, it's about us, Buddhist community. I call us a Kalyana Mita community. And it's, it's, it's important to, it's important <clears throat> each and every one of us here listening in, I hope you see yourself as a Kalyana Mita. What does it mean? It means you are a wholesome friend, and your job, your responsibility is to try and remind each other. We're not teachers. We are fellow practitioners. So we remind each other, hey, there is Kama. There is Dhamma. Kama, minimally Buddhist, must know and accept Kama, meaning to say. There are consequences consequences to your words and your action and of course your thoughts and we must try and keep them wholesome and we look after each other so that's being a kalyana meter keeping each other anchored on wholesomeness not not a kalyana meter does not instigate another to give vent to his anger and greed so your friends say, you know, I'm so angry, so and so. And you do what? You add condiments. If you add condiments, you are not a Kalyana meter. I don't know what you are, but you are definitely not Kalyana. Okay. Now, here I said, Vesa is a time where we affirm identity. You like it or not? In a regular world, in a, with a regular mind, we all walk around with identities. Okay, on the Vesa, in the Vesa period, we come together to feel joy that there is this community out there that shares our faith, shares our commitment, equally inspired by the things that inspire us. So we can identify with each other, mainly because we want to draw support from each other for our practice. And, and, and by words that says it's a social animal, sense of belonging can augment his effort to practice. That's true. You see, individually, we may forget. 
we may cave in to our desires individually. But when you're with like-minded practicing friends, you kind of tell each other, eh, hold the line, hold the line. Hey, we must remember pragmatic. So it's a reminder to be wholesome, a reminder to meditate. We can collectively do that for each other. And I said, collectively raising the water level of understanding, right? Means you come together, you learn together, you share the Dhamma together, then you collectively grow together. Okay, you pull everyone up. You know, recently I, I learned that trees in the forest have a network of roots underground. And by this network, help. There is a collective help given to each other. Using that as an anal analogy, I will say this. The Buddhist community must have a network of faith, a network support to anchor each other in faith, in morality, in giving, in wisdom. Sometimes Buddha add the fifth one, sota, which is in learning. So if you have the fifth one, you can learn together even best. Lagi bagus. Come together, learn together, practice together, serve together. That's the idea. So Vesa is a period. If you have not been serving community in the year, at least lah, can you raise up period to it? If you had not been giving dana in a whole year, you know, just honor your teacher and do it for the Vesa period. So all of you take out your, your, your checkbook or your credit card and, and give. But you can't go out and serve, right? If you can't do it, if you can't, then provide financial support for the ones who can especially support Sangha, especially. This period, this period is very hard for Sangha. You don't realize it, or you may not realize it, because who's feeding them? They can't come out and walk around and look for arms food. Who's looking after them? You have to. If you don't do it, who will? Okay? So as a community, do it. And the final point is an opportunity to inspire confidence for others. Buddha used to say this. He used, this is, this is one of the stock phrases that you'll find period. as you go through the, the suttas, you will find one of these stock, uh, this particular stock phrase. To inspire confidence of those who have faith and to bring on board the ones who have no faith, meaning to say, within the community, we all have faith. The actions done must inspire people, inspire confidence, get people all hyped up that this is Buddhism, Buddhism, I'm a Buddhist. You know? Get people all hyped up, that's one part. What you do should not put people off. There will be those who are not followers of the Buddha, of the Dhamma. They are neutral. They have no strong views against you. They're just neutral. Then what you do cannot put people off. And, and what would that mean? If you are a kusala, if you say, I'm a Buddhist, but then the next minute you suko somebody, right in front of everyone is scolding somebody else. Oh, you are certainly not inspiring. Okay? So just remember, by your action, you must inspire others. So Vesa is a really good period for that. There are really no not sure if you know this, but don't have. There are no rules. Then what do we do for Vesa, right? Inspire confidence in believer, triggering curiosity of non-believers. So how do you do that? My proposal, this is my proposal. Engage in activities that promote dana, sila, bhavana. Why this? 
because the Buddha himself, when he first taught lay people, he gave them three practices. This was the first three he gave. Dana, Sila, Bhavana. Dana means giving, being generous. Dana specifically, Dadati, it specifically means giving. Okay? So you can give anything. You can have intangible. It doesn't have to be money. Dana doesn't have to be just money. It is given. And it can be, as I said, tangible or intangible. Tangible giving will be food, medicine, necessities, and money, of course. Intangible giving could be what we're doing now, sharing the mark, giving your time to your parents, to the old folks, looking after people, sitting with them, and, and, and basically giving a part of yourself. Rather than spend it on your, on your pleasure and your leisure, you take this up to spend it on another to support another. Since we all are stuck at, by COVID, right? We all got trapped by COVID. Then do it. Do your parents, do your family. Give time. Guide them on the mark. Share a bit of the Buddha story. You can quote from my book. There are a lot of stories in there. Okay? So that's dana. Sila is basically observing precepts. That's at a very rudimentary level, a simple level. But the idea in Sila is Learn to restrain your anger and your greed, your desires. Learn to temple them, calm them down. Don't get so excited, don't agitated, sorry. Don't get so agitated. So instead, you want to practice wholesomeness. So on the Vesa period, if you had not been observing it for the year, but during the Vesa period, you try. You try and stay wholesome throughout the period. Giving, meta. Compassion, karuna, you just, sorry, meta is loving kindness. Huh? Um, friendliness, loving friendliness. So be friendly, be kind, be giving, and so on and so forth. Bhavana is cultivation, not meditation, cultivation. So by bhavana, it really, actually, dana sila are part of cultivation. And any effort to stay wholesome, to stay good, to, to be of of support and help to others, all these are bhavana. I also recommend reading. If you had not been reading the Ma, can you on Vesak Day at least read something? Pick a Dhammapada verse and keep that verse in mind, read it, enjoy it. So you really read on, uh, uh, on the Buddha's life or you read about the Dhamma, it's your choice. But spend a bit of time either reading or listening to Dhamma talk, engage in Dhamma. And of course, if you can spend some time to meditate, spend a bit of time to, to do that, great. And your meditation is, oh, very difficult. Never mind, do 10 minutes. Five minutes for the Buddha, five minutes for your parents, something like that. 10 minutes. You want to do more? Even better, because then you can share marriage with everybody. Okay? Sorry. Sorry, yeah? Wait, wait, wait. Uh, yes. So this is where I hope that you all will say something, write something to, to, sh to share with me. What does Vesak mean for you? Into, I don't know, chat, the chat group? Or you can I, text your, your input to the organizers of this talk. Okay. And the final slide. For those of you who have been following my talks, you will know that typically in a public talk, at the end of it, I will bring out this slide. And it's a reminder to everybody that as student of the Buddha, practitioners of Dhamma, we want to do everything right by him and giving gratitude. These are key elements of the practice. So hence, I've written it like this. If you had joy listening to the Dhamma, 
honor our teacher by putting it to practice his first teaching to the community, which is dana. And dana, I said giving, chaga, generosity. Be generous. Donate, help, support a worthy charity or spiritual organization. The organizer of today's talk, all worthy, all the organizers are worthy of your support. Going beyond just this group, check it out. There are sangha everywhere that need help. Go support. You don't have to give a lot. Some of you say, mm, I don't have a lot of money. You got one dollar. You got five dollars. You have a bit. Whatever that you have, just give, but give joyously. Give what you're comfortable with, then take, take, uh, rejoice in that. As much as you can. Then can then it's meritorious. If you rejoice, you feel very comforted. You feel, feel blessed that you can do that. You can give. You then that's when you have you can share merits. Okay. We must never take for things that enjoy in this life. As our fourth runners had done it right by us, meaning our the the the. the you are one version, there are other versions before you, right? Those are your forerunners. Your forerunners have done it right by us. We must continue the good work for those who come after. And this is my short um, aspiration for the Dhamma. So may the Dhamma last long. May we continue to enjoy supportive conditions for learning and practice. And may we never deviate from the true teaching as long as life lasts. So I conclude my talk. Let us also make aspirations. By the grace of the merits that we have accumulated, may we never follow the way of the foolish. May we be blessed with wise friends and skillful teachers who help us along the path of Dhamma. Wherever we may be until our final liberation, may we never stray from the path of Dhamma. May we always have the chance to practice Dhamma and one day realize the highest bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you for tuning in, sisters, uh, brothers and sisters in Dhamma, and thank you, Sister Silva, for your sharing.